All right. So we had stroke and retirement and the everlasting. Um, and now we're going to talk about death, just to keep everybody in the mood. Uh, <laughs> but relax, because it's not a person that we're going to be talking about, uh, but journalism. Let's see if I can figure out where to put this. Uh, like one of the earlier speakers, I write every day, and I've written my whole life, but uh, I never perform it. So this is all way out of my comfort zone. Uh, when I write, it's usually in private, and then somebody reads it. And that's basically what journalism is and has been for a long time. Um, we are in the process right now of a, a radical transformation, um, maybe as radical as the transformation that the previous speaker that you saw on the tape went through, because what comes out on the other side is not going to be anything like what we traditionally have known as journalism. Uh, new perspectives on the news and what it means to you, even if you don't read newspapers. And I suppose many of the people here don't. I won't even ask that question, because I know pretty much where it's going to get me. But how about anyone who has purchased a newspaper in the last week? Yes, yes, excellent, excellent. But you don't count, because that's... I know, I know where you're coming from, but you did, okay, and others, yeah. Anybody actually read it on a daily basis? Yeah, okay. Online. No, no, we were talking about an, an actual newspaper. Um, and what is journalism in 2010? Well, newspapers are pretty much what we traditionally have thought of as journalism. Magazines, a whole bunch of them, um, probably as many now as before, but they just don't tend to stay around as uh, long as they did in the past. TV and radio, yeah, journalism, turn it on every day, you can get to see it. Major media websites, probably what many of you check, um, hopefully, New York Times website, CNN. MSNBC, those kinds of places. Uh, independent websites, all different kinds, probably several that just started since this program began this morning. Wikipedia, well, I mean, that's, that's something that comes up in each one of my classes, whether or not Wikipedia is journalism, and certainly the question of whether or not you can use Wikipedia or something from Wikipedia in one of the papers that you might write for me. Uh, I find that my, my view of it is different, certainly, from many of the students, and whether or not it is journalism, uh, we can talk about a little bit later. Twitter, there's a great commercial on TV now. I can't remember exactly what it's for, but it's a news announcer, a traditional news announcer, saying, this just in from Twitter, confirmed by Facebook. Uh, <laughs> kind of ridiculous, but that's, that's where it's going. And a whole lot of other stuff that's coming up, like this. And so if we can, we can get this, just take a look at it, and then we'll answer the, or we'll try to ask the question about whether or not this is journalism. One woman slain in front of the world has become the face of an entire movement. We can't say her name enough. This is Nada at a protest rally in Tehran yesterday, just before something horrible happened. And as you know, social networking sites have helped spread images and video of the protests in Iran. But the story of Nada in particular has deeply shocked the country and the world. Our Octavia Nasser has her story. But first, a warning for you. Her report contains extremely graphic video that is disturbing. In addition, parents may decide it is inappropriate for their children. Her name is Neda. The facts surrounding her life and her death difficult to verify. She appears to have been a young student who joined thousands of her countrymen to voice her disapproval of Iran's election results. Eyewitnesses say Basij militiaman hiding on a building rooftop 
shot Nida in her chest, silencing her forever. A man who appears to be her father, desperately calling on her to open her eyes. A stranger begging her to stay awake. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, Nida, the man says. But Nida doesn't respond. She dies right there on the streets, another protester capturing her last moments on a cell phone camera. And just like that, Nida, who came to the square thinking she's one voice among thousands, turned into the voice of an entire opposition movement. Nida, which means the calling, is now on millions of clips across the globe, on the internet in specially designed avatars, a young life cut down in its prime, one woman's gripping story speaking volumes, a grim reminder of the price Iranians could pay for freedom. Octavia Nasser, CNN, reporting. Now on the screen at the same time, up in the upper right hand corner was amateur video. On the bottom, very recognizable CNN. All right. So what was it? Was it journalism? Certainly it gave us some information that we didn't have before. And so if that's the heart of what journalism is, then yes, it's journalism. Was it journalism in the traditional sense? What is it that it actually showed? It showed someone there on the street. We don't know exactly what happened. And even the reporter from CNN is careful to say what we see is, and what she's describing is based on reports from local people. All right, so the CNN that is reporting this was not there. So they didn't see it. The advantages of this kind of video are clear, right? So CNN was not allowed in as most of the traditional mainstream media were not allowed into Iran during this period of time. So without this video, we wouldn't have seen some of those scenes. CNN, is relying on the work of that amateur journalist. In fact, not even an amateur journalist, someone who just happened to be there. This video became a very powerful image of those elections in Iran. It also can be seen in some ways as a requiem for CNN and traditional journalism because uh, the field itself is changing so rapidly. That video won a George Polk Award, which is among the most prestigious awards for traditional journalism. It created quite a stir because here you have someone who is never even identified, we don't know who, whose camera it was, receiving an award that until now has been reserved for journalists. So you have someone who's doing the work or seems to be doing the work of a journalist, who's not a journalist, receiving a journalism award. That's one sense of how quickly this whole thing is transforming. What we're going to look at now is whether or not that will have an impact on you, even those of you who don't buy newspapers or read newspapers or get your news, however it might be, in sources that are not so traditional. So in order to do that, let's look at what is the tradition of journalism. And you have especially foreign reporting and international journalism, which is what I was focused on for much of my career. Traditional news gatherers like Richard Harding Davis from the New York Herald um, was one of the yellow journalists who sort of stirred up emotion in the late 19th century that got the United States into the Spanish-American War. He accompanied Teddy Roosevelt uh, and the Rough Riders up San Juan Hill. When Teddy Roosevelt was later on trying to get for himself the Congressional Medal of Honor, he used the reports from Richard Harding Davis to uh, back up his heroism 
and the United States Congress rejected it because Richard Harding Davis was so much of a publicist for Roosevelt that they didn't believe what he had reported. And Roosevelt didn't get the Congressional Medal of Honor until well after he had died. Another traditional journalist, Herbert L. Matthews of the New York Times. Um, in 1957, Matthews went into the hills of southeastern Cuba and interviewed a young rebel named Fidel Castro. Came back with an article that ran on the front page that presented Castro as a friend of the United States, someone committed to democracy and elections, who didn't want power for himself and simply wanted to return Cuba to constitutional rule. 1957. Uh, my second book is called The Man Who Invented Fidel, and it is about Herbert Matthews. Traditional uh, news gatherer. Anderson Cooper, CNN, also a modern version of the traditional news gatherer, although one who has made his mark by crying uh, on the scene, which was not really a traditional part of news gathering, but it's basically a large organization, goes out, gets the news, comes back and presents it, and you as the audience receive it. Um, there are now contemporary news sources. And most of you probably recognize Perez Hilton. Believe it or not, a couple of years ago, I spent an awful weekend at the New York Times tracking down the story that Fidel Castro had died and there was a transition going on. And when we finally tracked it down to its original source, yeah. <laughs> but it, it it, it started there, it got picked up by someone else, and got picked up by someone else, and before you knew it, it came to us in the newsroom, and uh, I had uh, written, and it's still there, uh, Fidel Castro's obituary, which we do in advance, and so it was something that I needed to be on. Uh, we had everything ready to go until we found out that this was the source, and it, uh, it all came apart. Of course, Fidel is still there today, and Perez Hilton, I don't know what color his hair is now, but he's still doing what he does. The, the basis of journalism and media until just last year has been a, um, a business model based on selling advertising. My salary at the New York Times, the money that it costs to send me around the world, the money that it cost for the satellite phones and all the rest of it basically came from the advertising that was in the newspaper. The actual price of the newspaper uh, only defrayed a small percentage of the overall cost of doing the journalism. Same thing for TV and radio, which uh, except for cable is free, you buy the products that are advertised, that's how the media company gets its revenues. Last year, for the first time, at a major newspaper like the New York Times, the cost of the newspaper has actually exceeded the cost, the amount of money that they get in from uh, advertising revenues. So that changes everything. Last year was an awful year for media all over. Losses all across the board including what we thought was going to be the compensation for all of that traditional advertising that was lost. Online ad revenues, overall down 5%. That leaves you in a position where the only choice you have, if you're going to continue quality journalism, is uh, to charge people for it. But in recent surveys, even people who have a favorite website where they go to for news, 82% of them said that if they were forced to pay for that website, they'd go somewhere else. What that means is that journalism has had to find a different way of doing what it has traditionally done. Uh, and that is taking advantage of the technology. Instead of having a remote truck that goes out there and all tons of equipment, you can have someone like my colleague Kevin Seitz who can show up with a camera, a video camera, an audio tape recorder, and with a cell phone, send images back from anywhere around the world. 
the advantages are obvious, it's cheap. The disadvantages are many. Uh, in part, he's never based in one place, so he roams from place to place wherever there's trouble. When there's trouble, you see a report. When there's a report, you think that it just happened. You don't have any of the background that allows you to understand where those problems came from. And going back to the video we saw originally, what you see may not give you the full picture. So this is from Richard Avedon, a, a famous photographer, who said there is no such thing as inaccuracy in a photograph. Same thing with video. All photographs are accurate. None of them is the truth. So the truth of what that video was that you saw at the beginning, we will know at some point in the future, but we don't know yet. We know that it's accurate that it showed that a woman died on that street. But where it came from, why she was there, what actually happened, and what it means, which is the truth of the story, we don't know. The newspapers and the traditional media will continue. They're not going to die tomorrow. Uh, New York Times in either its traditional form, online, or on the iPad, which a lot of people think may save it, will continue for a while. There'll be non-traditional sources like Global Post, a free website, bringing in professional journalists from around the world, and they're using a different means of supporting it. And uh, individual websites. Last year, last fall, when I received the Maria Morris Cabot Award at Columbia, Ioanni Sanchez, who runs Generación Y Griega from Cuba, also won. She was not allowed out to receive the award. That's how serious the old men in the Cuban regime feel about what she does in her website. Where do we go from here? Different organizations like ProPublica, News Trust, WikiLeaks, which just earlier this week released the video of the attack in Iraq from a few years ago that otherwise wouldn't have been released. Uh, an organization called FWIX, which brings it gathers together blogs from around the world and will provide them to the New York Times and other organizations. And who knows what else? The big question for you at the end is as this transformation takes place, the traditional parameters of trust, that is, a mainstream media organization like the New York Times devotes itself to providing you with news that you can trust, is being replaced by other sources. You have a choice from among many where you're going to get your news. Do you get it from a place that will give you the kinds of views that you already share, that's reassuring, or will they provide you with a truth that may not be necessarily exactly what you think and you believe, but is closer to the truth and therefore is inconvenient. Thank you very much.